Welcome to the Indie Author Showcase. I am your very sunburned host, Chad Robert Morgan. And I'm less sunburned. Uh, and coming at you from a different angle. Um, so it occurred to me that we're getting to the end of May, and it that is Asian American and Pacific Islander Month. And we haven't talked about it at all, which is kind of a thing because, first of all, somebody is what? part of the Asian American and Pacific Islander community. I am? You are. Wowzers. Thank you, white man. Yes, you are welcome. You know, I'm not gonna, who yikes. Ooh, who, who, I'm not going to say that. Getting us canceled already, are you? Oh, I... Uh, uh, yes. So, your mother is Filipino by birth. She came over here uh, on a work visa, and she is now a U.S. citizen. Wow, a white man's playing things. Can't believe you did. Well, do you want to explain it then? Uh, no. Well, then shut up! Hey, dude, I'm just pointing out the facts. Well, you're more than willing to take the reins and explain it if that's the way you feel. I'm right? not getting get a call. You should, you should explain it just real quick. Yeah, they said that you should explain it. They don't trust me. I'm a I'm a minor. Okay, so can I finish talking? Of course. Okay. Not only that, but my multi award winning book, The Baby Eater, is all based on Filipino mythology. So I, yes. the, I didn't know that. You sure so better know it at this point in time. Yeah, silence on a podcast. That's usually a good thing. So, anyway. The point being is that this is kind of a uh, Asian American and Pacific Islander uh, Heritage Month. It's kind of a big thing for us. So, I thought we would start by discussing something that we know a little bit about, which is the monsters in Filipino mythology. Yeah, you should uh, you should explain that real quick. Well, why don't you take the reins? Which ones do you remember? Oh man, I'm an amnesiac. Oh come on. <laughs> Start with the one that's on the cover of the book. Okay, all right, understood. So the first one you have is the Mananangal. The Mananangal is a member of the Aswang family. Uh, a beautiful woman by day. At night, she uh, roots her leg into the ground. Her uh, her wings sprout back. Um, her back sprouts wings. Um, she uses said wings to whip us open too, and then she uh, goes to take flight to hunt after unborn fetuses. Preferably unborn fetuses. Preferably, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, if they're, uh, if they're young enough, then I mean, I guess if uh, if a Minecraft streamer is attracted to them, then the, I'm on the goal to go after them. You know what I mean? So, but as she goes off to, uh... is that joke still relevant? Are people still clowning on like? Minecraft streamers for being pedophiles, is that still like a thing? Probably not, but uh. you So, anyway. But, being that she is a creature that goes through the night and hunts for the unborn, she's also known, according to her book, as the Baby Eater. According to your book. Hence the title. Yes. According to your book. Yes, yes according to my book. Wait, I need to add that that's not like a common thing, no. Nope, nope. That is, uh, that's just him. Well, it's actually a bit of a running gag because the main character, uh, what was the main character's name again? I'm trying to remember. What was the main character's name again? I forgot. You know what the main character's name is. Mm, I do? You do? Come on. I, I can't seem to remember. Yes, you do. Right. Alexander. Ah. Speaking of Bella somewhere, I can't remember where though. Yeah. So I used your name as placeholder and I just never got around to uh Oh Alexander was my name? Uh-huh. Oh you're so you think you're funny. I anyway. am funny. No. Yeah. Really. I, I know. So, don't worry. I got that a lot. Alexander is uh like somebody else I know. An American born half Filipino who goes Back to the Philippines with his mother. And has an amazing sense of humor. It is very awesome and very cool. Point being is uh, he does not speak the language and he keeps struggling with the pronunciations. Notice how he, uh, he didn't uh, hear that I was saying that he's really funny and they didn't hear that. 
I'm honored, truly. You know, you mumble like that, the mic can barely pick my, it up. My throat is going through it, okay? Anywho, the point being is that the title of the book comes from the fact that the Alexander in the book does not know Tagalog and stumbles on the pronunciations. And so they keep and they keep trying to correct them. And he finally gets frustrated. It's the baby eater, the thing that's eating the babies. That's what we need to stop. So hence the title, the baby. Now I thought about naming it something else like the Mananagal or something like that, but it's like, I it didn't think that would really resonate that much. You know what I mean? Like, like to, to, I mean, I think, anybody from the philippines would see that and recognize it but to the rest of the world they would be kind of now the mononagal is like dracula to like the western world like like the mononagal is pretty famous right Ooh, i'm going to haunt you and Ooh, i'm going to suck it in your blood okay point oh, no, i was making a dracula joke yeah Point being I had, a, is a, I had a real joke about Dracula and sucking, but you <laughs> You suck, really. Yeah. No. So Whoa. <laughs> Calm down. I'm a minor. Anyway. Point being is that your family, uh your mother's family, I should say, was very excited to find out that we were doing a book on the Mananaga. Mm -hmm. So and we see that a lot of times when we go on the conventions, right? Where we're, they, they'll sit there, they'll look at the book, and they're like, you know what? We used to have something like that in my country. We called it a mononagal. And that's when I pulled the t-shirt where it actually has the definition on the back and the whole nine yards. And people get really excited. Remember the one guy at WonderCon that got all, like, excited? Yeah. And then it, it was like, uh, then we told him that the main character's name was Alex. It's like, dude, my name's Alex. I'm, I'm half Filipino. It's like, oh. And then we said the next book was going to take place in uh, uh, the Coachella Valley. And, like, the other guy started freaking out because he was from Indio and everything like that. It was just, it was very surreal. Yeah. Yeah. That was freaky. Yeah. Go, white boy. Go, white boy. I'm going to point to you, by the way. Go, white boy. Go, white boy. Go. Mm-hmm. Thank you for the mild racism. Anyway. No, no, don't worry. I, I can get worse. <laughs> Let's not get us canceled. Okay. Anyway. Will do. Can you name another creature from Filipino mythology? Ooh. He said don't get canceled for being racist. Okay, don't get canceled. Woo! I, some, something just popped into my head, okay? And I shouldn't say it because it's incredibly racist. Towards white people? Oh, no, not at all, dude. That's who... You can call that friendly fire at that point, dog. I'm getting... Ooh, ooh, ooh. Anywho, can you name another creature from Filipino mythology? The, uh, the Tikbalang. Okay, well, explain to me what a Tikbalang is. Horse demon. Trickster horse demon. You can tame it by pulling its three little chinny chin hairs. Uh, you said chin hairs. So the version I book, or I read said the three hairs from its mane. Oh, no, it, it is the mane. Uh, the, the chinny chin chin was a reference to the three little pigs. Oh, okay. So. My little chinny chin chin. But yes, according to the legend, to tame the Tikbalong, you have to capture its the three hairs out of its mane. Right. So. Uh, the Tikbalong is a creature that we used in our short story, Race the Night, from our first young adult anthology, uh, The Last Rite, Short Bites, Volume 1, Bloodlines. So, and we just finished our first Tikbalong to sell at Monster Palooza next week. Wow. Wowzers. Mm hmm. So, can you name me another one? Uh, Tianic. And what's a Tianic? Um, baby demon guy. Not really baby demon guy. Uh, close. Uh, more of a baby zombie guy. Oh, yay. Yeah. Would you really call him a guy, though? Well, I mean, you know, you used the word guy, but... Uh, I mean... Where do Tianix come from? And they are unbaptized. And then they die. Yes. They get reborn as little zombie baby man. And then they go and they eat all the non-little zombie baby bats. Yes. So, according to legend, um, if, if you were a... Uh, 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 a mother who uh, who had an unwanted pregnancy, uh, and you 
basically tried to ditch the baby, just left it out in the woods to die, uh, with it being unbaptized, it would come back as a flesh-eating ghoul to, to try to seek revenge. Isn't that like an odd like, set of circumstances, though? Not as odd as you would think. Oh, okay, well... Um, little me supply. Well, go back to before modern medicine. I mean, even today in the Philippines, uh, abortion is, is outlawed. It's illegal. Right. Um, so if you have an unwanted pregnancy and you can't get an abortion, what are you going to do? So think back to when the legends first came out where we didn't even have things like abortions or um contraceptives or anything like that um ditching a kid and uh unwanted child in in the woods especially if you didn't know who the father was or if the father was somebody like you know the local spanish missionary priest or somebody else's husband or something like that so um yeah i mean maybe not common in the modern era but if you go back to before western medicine and that kind of thing before you know philippines actually had a government or something like that yeah i can see that happening uh, fairly often and then you have the fact that it, the child is non-baptized tells me that the legend either came post the spanish arrival to the Philippines, or the legend was modified after the, the Spanish missionaries arrived and brought Catholicism to oh, the Philippines. Spanish missionaries, always the Spanish missionaries, dude. But there is actually, have you ever heard of a show called Trece? Uh, yes. Yes, based on the graphic novel, which... Because you've told me. I Well, I've told you, but uh, I have not told the audience. So... I have not read the graphic novel, but I did watch the Netflix series that's based on the graphic novel. Uh, very good anime style series. Basically, it's like Buffy the Vampire Slayer if she was Panay. What does Panay mean? Filipino. Filipino. Um, also, you could have just said Panoy. No, because Panoy is the masculine form. Oh, my bad. So, Tresse was a girl, therefore. Panay. So. I've been educated. Um, anyway, there was a really good episode where she was investigating uh, a murder. And it, it turned out that some uh, movie star, um, Starlet, had gotten rid of a, uh, a baby and it came back as a Tianic. And so that was a good episode. Um, I highly recommend checking out Tresic. Um Really good series. Anywho, can you think of anybody else? No. Oh, come on. I had at least one more in the book. Not really a monster, but a, but a, from Filipino mythology. I do not seem to recall. No. What was the, um, the Mananagal's sister? Silence here in a podcast. I, 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 like that's going over very well for no, those that aren't no, watching the no, video. No, 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 no. You know what they say? Sometimes silence is the loudest. Mm -hmm. That's very loud silence. Extremely loud because uh, how do you not remember the Makakulam? Because uh, my memory is terrible. This is your it's... culture we're talking about now. Hey, my bad, man. And keep in mind, we're just talking about the ones that I used in the book. There's still, like, a bunch of ones that, that uh, I didn't use, like the Crypt Key. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know that is either. <sighs> Which one was the Crypt Key? I don't know. Why would you use that? Thing? Google uh, time. Google th I think the Crypt Key was the one that was a cross between a troll and a dryad. It was like a giant uh, tree thing. Remind me of the imps from Lord of the Rings. I think that was the Crypt Key. No, not Cookie. Uh, 
But while you're looking that up, let's discuss the maca coulomb. Yeah, I don't know how to spell it. I would think it was with a K. K R I P E. Crip. K R I P K E. Anyway, let's discuss the maca coulomb. So the maca coulomb. No, those are shrimp crackers. Is basically a witch. Right. Right. So, in the story, the sister of the Mananagal is a Makakula, right? But she's like, Glinda, she's a good witch. <laughs> so, um, in my research, I read this interesting story where it talked about where, where Makakula came from and the whole, like, they're in league with the devil and all this kind of thing. Not, and, not the devil. Well, but what it came out from is before the Spanish, Marco Coulombs uh, were medicine women, right? They were the healers. They were the spiritual advisors. They were the ones that were chasing the demons away. You know, they were um, very similar to like um, uh, exorcists kind of thing. Like the movie? Huh? Like the movie? Not like the movie, no. Um, but you know, if something, you know, they were the healers of, of the village and sometimes they would use herbal remedies. Sometimes they would use rituals to, ch you know, chase away the bad spirits, you know, whatever, uh, particular ailment was happening that, and they would, you know, pick whatever they thought would fix it. Um, when the Spanish came, they did not like the fact that there was multiple routes to the divine. Right, they wanted the one. They wanted their god to be up front, uh, and they wanted to be the only conduit to Jesus. Right, right. So they had to do a smear campaign on the medicine women. You know, then they they stopped becoming folk healers and became witches. Ah, you know. Why is it? Why is why are witches called witches? That's like a dumb word. Why are witches called witches? Yeah. You want me to analyze um, English dictums at this point? Yes. I, no, that's I think it's a little bit above and beyond. Is my... it because it rhymes with? I have no idea. Yeah. Anywho. Yeah. yeah. If we could. Sorry. We're yeah. laughing. My bad. It was really funny. So. Anywho. So those are the ones that we use in our stories. Uh, but there, well, there's actually one more. There was uh, the legend of the three ladies. Do you remember that from the book? No. You, did you even read my book? Yes, I have to sell it. You have to sell it. That doesn't mean you have read it. Uh, why would I read it? But no, why would I sell it if I haven't read it? I don't know. Sometimes I worry with it. You so yeah, in my research, I found the the, the legend of the of the three ladies in white, or or the, um, basically they were an omen of death. Like you would get a knock on the door, and you would open up, and there would just be these three ladies, and they would just stand there, and they don't say nothing, and then they just walk off and disappear into the night. An, an omen of death. Yep. It's pretty spooky. That's death with a th, not death with a. F, you know, it's not an omen of death, you know, omen of death. Yeah, I, I, I mean, you sound like you said death, you know, like, 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 like they curse you into not being able to hear. I mean, yeah, no, that'd be pretty bad too, yeah. It'd be way very inconvenient, but I don't think it quite has the, the, the gut punch of death, right? But supposedly, whenever they show up, death was coming. What's the point? So, I mean, that's, in one book and one short story, I got about four different things from Filipino mythology all worked up in there. Make it seven. Make it seven? Yeah. What do you want me to do next? Uh, I don't know, go back and update the previous ones. You know, drop a patch notes real quick. It don't work that way. It's a book, man, is it? <laughs> well, it's... The book doesn't have DLC. <laughs> What you, that's what the epilogue's for. That's just DLC. It's kind of an epilogue. 
Oh, well, then that is second epilogue. I'm mm-hmm. not adding to the book that's already published <laughs> and it's be, already won multiple awards. There can, there can be two epilogues. Two epilogues. Two epilogues. Two epilogues. You know, this actually brings up an interesting conversation. Um, whether or not to use prologues and epilogues. Okay. Well, it's about the time we're supposed to be selling the book with you. Well, I mean, but you brought this up and go on a tangent here for a bit. So, some people are of the opinion that prologues are bad. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, and epilogues are bad. And I think they get a bad rap just because of how they've been used. So, let's look at the first Harry Potter novel. Okay? The very first chapter, in my opinion, should have actually been a prologue. Was it not? No, no, there's no prologues in any of the Harry Potter novels. Oh. Um Lame. I love prologues. Well how dare the lame Harry Potter series not include prologues. Well, I think the first chapter in the first book could have easily been a prologue. And here's here's the reason why. Yes, yes. It is the only chapter in the entire book that's not told from the point of view of Harry. Right. Okay. First half of the chapter is told from the point of view of his uncle. Gandalf. Oh. Oh, Gan- wait. Gandalf? My <laughs> bad. I meant to say a Gandalf. Who? Wait, no. Wait, that's not his name. Uh, what's his name? Not Gandalf. What's his name? Anywho. The old mystical wise guy. The old mystical wise guy? <laughs> what was he in the mafia? <laughs> Yo, hey, you know, I heard, heard the Death Eaters are going to make what? you a deal you can't refuse. You know what I'm saying? No, no, I'm talking about the guy who's like, what was it? Did you look into the guy with the fire? Gandalf said calmly, and then, like, in the movie... Dumbledore. Oh. The Dumbledore. Jeez, I his God. Name. I Damn. thought it was son of a G, my bad. That's why I, call him, that's why I accidentally called him Ganondorf, my bad. Anyway. What's first half of the first chapter, getting back on topic. First half of the first chapter is told from the point of view of his uncle Dursley. His uncle Vernon Dursley, right? The second half, as you mentioned, is told from the point of view of Dumbledore. All right? He shows up, he turns off the lights and everything like that. So we don't even meet Harry until the end of that first chapter. Right? right? Whole rest of the book is from Harry's point of view. Okay? Well, regardless. Anyway. Point is, is that that first chapter would have worked well as a prologue. I think one reason why a lot of people bash on prologues and epilogues is because they've been used very poorly in the past. Right. Um, like, um, I'm trying to think of a good example of, of a... Well, I know one, but I don't want to talk about it right now. I, I want to say that for, for another thing. Um, Talk about your prologue? No, no. I, I think I use my prologues very well. Um, I actually don't do prologues, for example, with Intergalactic Space Force. There's no need for one, right? So a prologue is is something that starts off the story, but it's still separate from the for the story. Again, let's look at um, Harry Potter, right? That starts off the whole series, right? You're hearing about these weird people, you know, and it's part of those people kind of thing, you know. Well, because he knew about uh, his wife's sister's side of the family, you know, and, and her associates. Oh, 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 oh. Right. Oh, okay. And then and then we hear that, you know. Oh, just racist. This, well, he was not racist, but anti-wizard-ish. Yeah, when, when he's like... I don't want them affiliated with those people. No, I don't like their kind. Like, well, he was, <laughs> but he was prejudiced against wizards. 
So <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. So, um, but then you know we we find out that that the main bad guy got killed and. Uh, there's one survivor, and he's very special, and all this kind of stuff. And it sets everything up. The bad kind of prologue is the kind that seems to not connect at all with the story. And I think this is why it's gotten a bad rap. Like, like if there was a prologue that said, um, you know. I taught you how to file taxes. And then the rest of the book. Was, was about... a space adventure kind of yeah. thing. Yeah. And then there's like one part at the end was like, oh, I remember, I remember one time I learned how to do tax. You know what you just reminded me of? By the time you get back, my hate boner for this book. The Alchemist. Okay, a little bit of context. The Alchemist's prologue. You know the legend of Narcissus, right? Yeah. The whole thing is basically they added on to the end of Narcissus where they basically, like a fairy came and talked to to the water and was like, hey, why, why are you sad that Narcissus has died? And the lake was like, oh, I'm really depressed. I'm really sad. Because now I can't look at myself through his eyes and see how beautiful I am. And I'm like, oh. And it's like, the alchemist thought that was wonderful. And then just, we just completely dropped that. Narcissus is never mentioned again. There was no plot relevance for Narcissus. did just bring him up like, oh, man. What a wonderful ending that I, the author, just came up with. How beautiful and thought-provoking. Okay, we're never going to mention that ever again. You know, we're just going to throw that aside. Uh, Narcissus has shown up once, and that's it. Nothing else. Right. So I think, so, for my, my horror novels, I tend to do prologues and epilogues because... Um, I tend to use the prologue to set everything. Like, let's look at the Baby Eater, for example. The Baby Eater, uh, the prologue takes place about 19 years before the main story because what we're seeing is um, the conception of Malaya, which is one of the main characters, right? Then we go 19 years to where Alex meets her in the Philippines and... That whole adventure. And then, of course, after the book ends, we have an epilogue, which is about a year afterwards, where we find out what happens to the Mana Nagal. Uh, again, I don't want to get spoilery, you know. Uh, but we also see what happens to um, to Alexander. How, how has he adapted? What happened to him after the adventure? And it does kind of, you know tease and set up what could possibly happen later um but to me it kind of bookends the story right uh we do the same thing with the last right and the last right the prologue and epilogue could have been chapters right it could have been chapter one it could have been chapter 43 or whatever right um but i think it worked well as a prologue because in 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 the prologue we see somebody trying to escape with the last right and she fails and then we are introduced to our two main antagonists right the two ops the what two ops two ops god you know what you should do i should teach you how to say that word completely wrong it's slang don't worry i should i should teach you how to use that just completely wrong okay. that'd be hilarious Okay, anywho. I need, to, I need to explain that to you. Oh boy, I'm going to teach you like, ops means your grace, best friends. Use it when you talk about your best friends. Okay, anywho, can we get back on topic? Yeah, I'm sorry, my bad. So, the prologue introduces us to our two main antagonists, right? Um, they're there when uh, this heroine fails to escape with the last right. They recover the last right. And uh, the story starts properly at chapter one. But we, you know, we see our antagonists throughout the, the story. The epilogue, we see the fallout for our antagonists now that their mission has failed. Right? Um, and then we, we see kind of the repercussions and, and, and we see where their character arcs might be going uh, past this novel right and to me that 
it, it made for nice bookends. Now, again, I could have called it chapter one and chapter 43. It would have worked just as well, right? But the fact that we are looking at it from the point of view of the antagonist on both ends kind of bookended the whole story, in my opinion. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I felt that that worked. In my current book, uh, which the working title is Fear, I am planning on doing the same thing. I have a, a prologue where we uh, are introduced to one of the antagonists, again, something like like uh, 10 or 20 years before the story proper. But his experience sets him up as the antagonist. And then uh, we see the repercussions of that prologue. And, and that's motivating the antagonist throughout the end. And I plan to write the epilogue where our main character, our heroine, um, after surviving, how how is she dealing with it? How has she moved on? And maybe a little bit of a tease of what might be coming down the pipe later. See, And, and again, it kind of bookends it. But I, I, again, I, I think it the reason why epilogues and prologues kind of get a bad rap is... is um, People have misused them so badly that they don't have any relationship. Um, like, for example, uh, Todd's book, which we're going to discuss on the next podcast. It has a prologue. It has a good epilogue to it. I did not like the prologue because I didn't see how the prologue tied into anything else that was happening in the book. Right? Now, the epilogue made sense because that sort of wrapped up the main story arc of Metafe. Um because uh the whole story he he uh he's an immortal he he lost his his greatest love that, that he's been keeping in this locked in this gym he can't figure out how to get her out um and this is a driving force uh for this character throughout the book and then at the end uh again I don't want to get spoilery but the epilogue kind of shows what happened after he gets past that hurdle. Again, I don't want to say if he solved it or not or whatever it did because I don't want to spoil it, but um, his resolution to that story arc is then kind of wrapped up in the epilogue, uh, which again is after or past the point of view of Metafe or any of the other characters. So to me, the epilogue worked. The prologue, I was kind of turned off by because there was like these two unicorns and there's this this fountain and they get this prophecy and then like i think they show up like once my little pony like two-thirds of the way through the book as kind of this deus ex machina that part i didn't like but i did i i dig the epilogue i did not like the prologue i like i like the prologue just to throw two unicorns on a Well, we can talk about that more on the next podcast when we review Todd's book. But for this podcast, sticking with the um, Asian American and Pacific Islander theme of the podcast, we are going to review Mask of Halaya. You know, the thing that's right at the same point. We'll pull, pull it out. Yeah, there you go. The Mask of Halaya. So this is our first comic book review so, what was really nice about this is um can you pronounce it is that uh quinto comics is that how you pronounce that quinto i'm going to assume so because uh i am so this is an independent comic book company that is, the comics are written, drawn, and published all by Filipino women. Yep. So, I'm a big fan of that. Uh, a big fan of, first of all, again, having been married into the Filipino culture, I'm a big fan of anything Filipino because, you know, I love my son. Thanks. 
I love you too. I, I my heart is swelling three sizes right now because of that. Hey, yes, you're welcome. Anyhow, I got you, dog. Right. <laughs> Anyhow, um, I'm also a big fan of um, anybody writing to kind of fill a, a specific niche because everybody should have representation. Uh, like back in the day, I was a big fan. Well, maybe not a big fan, but I was a fan of Milestone Comics. Do you know what Milestone was? Uh, really progressive. And... Well, Milestone was uh, owned, published, and written and drawn all by African American oh. oh. uh, artists, right? So all their characters were African American. Um, and they had a few titles that might sound a little bit familiar. Uh, one was Icon and Rocket. And then I see that's not striking a chord. With I you. have never heard of that before. You might have if you've watched Young Justice. Because Icon and Rocket do make appearances in that show. Oh yeah, I watched some of that. Yeah. Pretty good. Um, then there is also uh, probably the most famous character to come out of Milestone. Which is Static Shock. Oh, yeah, no, I know that. Yeah. Oh, yeah, they had a really good television series. Yeah. My favorite was one that I, I, I think kind of fell by the wayside, but it was called Hardware. And he was sort of like their version of Tony Stark. Oh, I, yeah, you have comics of him, I saw him. Yeah. So what he did, so the, the twist on this one was he was like a Tony Stark-like genius, but he was working for a Tony Stark. Actually, he, it was more like he was working for, what's the... What was the bad guy I don't know. in Iron Man 2? I don't know. The evil, Sam Rockwell played? Yeah, evil technology man. Yeah. So he was like working for um like Roxxon Corporation or something like that, right? He was he was working for um the bad guy version of Tony Stark. And so he found that his designs and everything were being misused. So instead of getting upset, throwing up his arms and quit. He started basically stealing the technology back, forming the hardware suit and the hardware persona, and then fighting against his own employer, using his employer's uh, resources against them. So it was, it was kind of, I liked hardware. Um, so what happened was Milestone was eventually bought out by DC and the more popular characters got rolled into it. That's why Icon and Rocket appeared in Young Justice. And Static Shock had his own TV show where he hung out with the Justice League. Yeah, Static and Shock was a good TV show, dude. I also liked him on uh, when he shows up in uh, Justice League Unlimited at the end with, with uh, Batman Beyond. Yeah. That was fun. I like that. What are you going to say? Oh, yeah. No, no, no. Point being, I was a big fan of milestone back in the day because it was trying to do something new it was trying to do something pro progressive and it was trying to do something that was filling a a niche well maybe not niche but it was trying to fill a market that was not that was being neglected right that's the point let's get to the comic review that's sort of what i'm trying to get back to yeah, exactly, is that exactly. is that this company is trying to do the same thing this is trying to not only um be progressive in terms of, of being an all female uh, Filipino feminism, but also Filipino as well. Yeah. yeah there you go. So we got about the first four issues. I, five. I, do we have five issues? Yes. Five issues. Um, I was hoping to see them at WonderCon to get the next issue, but it, they weren't there. So I looked, we couldn't find them. Um, so what did you think about the comics? Oh uh, yeah, they're pretty good. I mean, like not perfect. I mean, here's one thing, right? It gets kicked off very fast, and then it just kind of doesn't slow down. Um, which in this case, I want <clears throat> like a little bit of time to just kind of like chill and like get to know the characters. At least the tiniest bit would have been nice. Um, because right now they're all like, what is it like? Cool aunt and confused teenager. So, because like it, it, it just keeps going, and we don't really get any time to actually just sit down with these characters. But I mean, like other than that, I mean, like the alts, uh, like fantastic. The alt is great. Um, 
like the alts are great, the paneling's good, which I feel like I could just loop that back to the alt. Um, the plot is interesting, you know. Well, I, 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 I hear you about what you're saying about the rapid pace, but I think that part of that is the nature of comic books themselves, because you only have like something like like what is it, maybe forty pages to 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 get a snippet of a story across. Um, cause I'm trying to think back to other comic books that I, I've, I've read throughout the past. Um, you're really thrown into the action. Um, you don't have a lot of time to, um, the character development has to come over the course of several issues. You yeah. can't really do it all on one issue. Typically. I, um, I just read too much manga. I'm biased. Oh, maybe. Um, maybe you need to read some more, more, more classic stuff. See, this is why you need a haircut. You won't stop doing this. I like doing it. What's wrong yeah. with that? Uh, because you got too much hair. I like having long hair. So I like being able to just in like in the long wind. I like going into the pool and just watching it all wave. Oh, that's that feeling. So real, so real, dude. You wouldn't know. Because you all... I just now got visions of you coming out of the pool like the chick from Fast Times at Richmond High now. Just, just... No, not even no, not even like that. When I'm in the water and I feel it flowing, oh, superb. One of the best parts about having long hair is being able to just kind of like... It's like a stress toy, you know what I mean? One of my favorite lines in the first issue was they have every drug except contraceptive. Yeah. I thought that was funny. Mm, that's just true, yeah. But I think now that we're into the fifth episode or the fifth issue, we're starting to get um, our feet under us. Because I, I kind of got the feeling that, that now we're getting to the point where uh, the main character has kind of come to the realization that she's got powers. Um there's something weird going on with her and now she's at the point where she's starting to figure out how to use them. Right. Um, like what it reminds me of is I uh, remember with Yu Yu Hakusho. Yeah. And they, they spent like half of the first season with him, like just trying to keep his body alive and everything like that. Yeah. That all was Loki, like hella peak. I, I really like that part. Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be on it. I'm a fan for the Paul or Yusuke is trying to like, oh Yusuke, how I miss that. You know what I mean. But the point being is, once he got back to being alive, and he went um, to meet, uh, what's the short woman's name? The 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 blue hair. Yeah, you know, um, Genkai. I was, think so. Um, Genkai. Was it Genkai? No, that's yeah. or is that Dragon Ball? Am I getting my anime mixed up? No. You've never watched Dragon Ball. And I don't know. Same character named Genkai. Named Dragon Ball. Anywho. They, they start the training. Um, and everything like that. And... Yes, Genkai. Yeah. And, and that's when, for me, the show actually starts becoming the show that we know. Right? Right. Uh, because, again, the whole thing is he's a spirit detective. That's when he gets his training to be a detective. And then... Genkai stays on as a mentor and ally throughout the rest of the series, or at least as far as I've gotten. I'm still in, like, the third season. Um, I kind of get the feeling that where we are in issue five is in that is the equivalent spot that we were in Yu Yu Hakusho when he first meets Genkai, and he first starts his training, right? Yeah. So we, we've gone, th in the first four episodes, we've gone through, through um, girl, discover you know, girl freaks out because she's got powers, um, as one does. As one does, right? Doesn't understand them, starts to come to turn to them, uh, comes to terms with them, and then now has found a mentor to start training her and for her to start preparing for this destiny that she's supposed to have. Yeah. So, you know, as all people do. Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm, and again, I, I, I think now it's, it's starting to find its rhythm, and that's why I was really hoping to find the next issue, because I wanted to see what happens next. And it's really hard to review a comic book series, because by its very nature, it doesn't really have a beginning, a middle, and an end, right? 
the story is contiguous and it just it kind of keeps going because that's how you sell more comic books right so see that's how i know manga and that's the definitely because all my favorites are ending you know that or just they, they just never finish talk, talk to you, Hunter, Hunter. well i mean but i mean that's the thing right i mean look at the you know spider-man superman batman you know they they they, they go on forever and in fact uh they've gone on for so long that that uh, dc and marvel keep doing these like reboot things where they merge universes and, and sh reshuffle the deck and hit the reset switch you know they do a flashpoint where everything gets re reset and they get to start over looking at you paul paul who Did not know that? that's like the big like spider-man controversy that in the latest like version of character named paul everyone hates and it's it's really funny. I like it. The, like the story with Paul sucks. I'm not gonna throw it out there. Whatever Paul has going on, he can keep doing that. Um, oh yeah, it's really funny. Well, you actually have a custom skin for your backpack. That's a Mask of Halaya skin. I don't own it. Yeah, you do. No, I yes. just... Your backpack came with it. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. We, in fact, we had the skin first, and we had to wait like almost a year for the backpack to get delivered. I'm calling my lawyer. What are you doing? I'm, I'm phoning a friend. So, your backpack is from Equilibrium, right? Yes. Which is a Filipino company. Yeah. So they teamed up with uh, the comic book for the Mask of Hawaii comic book and actually sold a custom skin. When we bought your backpack, when we ordered your backpack at WonderCon, we bought the custom skin and it came with a set of the comics, which kind of pissed me off a little bit because I had just bought them. So that's why I have two sets. Yeah. But you have a skin for your backpack, which is a Mask of Hawaii skin. So if you go to Equilibrium, buy the backpack, you can order, I think there's two different ones, is there? Yeah. There's two different Mask of Hawaii skins? I'm not going to say any words about the backpack itself, though. I'm not going to... What? They're awesome backpacks. They're, like, really big and bulky. Well, and you... they, they don't... Hold... But they're, they're modular, so you can actually swap them out for smaller pieces. And they don't... No, like, the main backpack itself is already really big and bulky. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't hold that much, in reality. Trust me, I struggle to fit all my like school bags and like like Chromebook and books in there because it doesn't hold that much. Well, maybe you need to uh, rejigger your bag because they're coming kind of modular pieces, and you can like disconnect and reconnect yeah, but different the, pieces. The, the main core itself is already too bulky, so I'm like, what? what yeah, but that's what I'm saying. The main cord, you can take that whole rest of the backpack off the cord and replace that for maybe one that bets better fits with your your needs at school. That's what I'm saying. It's modular. The core of the backpack. Yes, the core of the backpack. I get it. You're saying it's big. No, I'm not. Yeah. yeah. It's designed to better distribute the weight on your back. Okay. Because it's really heavy. Yes, just because you don't fucking appreciate everything okay. your mother and I do yeah, for you. Okay. Yeah. 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 I'm grateful. A little snot. <laughs> that was an expensive backpack. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm not saying it wasn't. I'm saying the other backpack was cool. Don't think I see why I needed a new one. I like having a green one. It's very homey. The little green one was mine. Then I can see why. Yeah, yours broke. I can see. Yeah, that one for years, but eventually it wore out. Yeah, it seems like it had for years. So anyway, now that this podcast has gone completely off the goddamn rails. Yay! Anyways, uh, we wrap this up? Let's wrap this up. Uh, so, next podcast, we're going to talk about Todd's book. Yeah. We really need to find a good way to wrap up the show now. Yeah, we hit with a little toodaloo, you know We're I mean? not doing toodaloo. Toodaloo. We're not doing toodaloo. Toodaloo.